Um, so we're going to, uh, in case you were not sure, we're going to talk about patents and copyright and trademarks uh, and the way that they influence free and open source software developers. So um, I, I work at the Open Invention Network, which runs a defensive patent pool for Linux, GNU, Android, and a bunch of other free and open source software projects. Uh, I am uh, not a lawyer, so uh, if you're going to go out and make a super expensive business decision based on this information, um, don't do that because I am definitely not your lawyer. Um, what I do hope to give you is enough context because the last thing you want to do is get uh, patent, copyright, or trademark 101 from your lawyer. I'm not saying they won't give it to you for $300 an hour, but it's probably not the best use of your money. So uh, I'm going to cover uh, the three different areas of the law that uh, we call intellectual property, which is kind of a it's a construct, but I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to beat that one down for you. But um, so we'll talk about trademarks, which are for logos, names, and symbols. Uh, copyright, which covers the written word, art, and music, uh, and then patent law, which is intended to cover inventions. Uh, and so we'll go over sort of what it covers. And then for most of these, we'll look at a little bit of the history so that we can see the supposed intent behind the law, because uh, each of these areas has sort of expanded over time. And understanding the historical underpinnings might give you some idea of why they've expanded into these places that seem otherwise just kind of random and weird. Uh, and then how we as uh, FOSS creators use each of those tools. So. <clears throat> Trademarks, uh, as I said, are names, logos, and symbols. And so if you're a web developer, you could kind of think of it as the style sheet. It's not what it does, it's how it looks. Um, and uh, some of the earliest uh, trademarks would be uh, on bakeries, on baked goods. So um, <clears throat> these are mooncakes, and so the, they have uh, Chinese characters on the top that indicate what bakery they're from and what filling is inside there. And so the, the idea of uh, marking your trade good is so that you know where it's coming from and, um, you know, like who produced it. And then maybe, uh, depending, you know, is it safe? So a lot, of, um, a lot of foodstuffs that people would get would come in a big sack. And if they'd been sent around a long time, then they might have a lot of extra impurities in them. So like things that were common were like sawdust or lead or ash like inside the flour. So once you put the name of where the, um, the food stuff is coming from, then you're sort of like on the hook. So it's like you've built your reputation like, oh, this is only 10% sawdust. You're going to love it as opposed to that 20%, 30% sawdust you get from the unmarked bag. So uh, it also maybe answers the question, like, is this going to be delicious? Like that one last time with the bananas in it was awesome, but what, which, what am I getting? So um, that's kind of the idea behind trademark. And, uh, and that uh, helps you understand, like, it's, it's really about trying to keep you from impersonating another, uh, another trader. Uh, so one of the earliest, uh, or actually the earliest trademark a uh, logo to be trademarked is the Bass Triangle, which you, maybe you can't see there, but maybe you've seen Bass Beer before, so you don't need to. But <clears throat> And I put this up because the red triangle, like red triangles are not, you know, they're not super unique, right? Like you've probably seen them on other things. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind about trademark is that it's specific to that field of endeavor. So uh, for instance, I live in Boston and we have this huge sign over uh, Fenway Park. Uh, Sitgo is gas, uh, and it's, um, it's definitely not beer. So they don't get sued by bass for using the red triangle because, uh, I mean, unless you've really had too much beer, you are not going to confuse gasoline and beer, right? So there's no, uh, they don't have a problem with each other. It's far enough away from the field of endeavor that they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You could use a red triangle. Plus, theirs is a little different and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, where you do end up with problems is when uh, you have fields of endeavor that maybe had started out separate and then start to get a little bit closer together. Have people read this story about uh, Apple Corporation versus uh, Apple Records? So, um, so Apple computers, you've probably heard of them. Even here at a, a GNU Linux event, right? Um, there's actually one over here. Uh, but 
So, uh, and then Apple Records, which produces, you know, that, that's the Beatles recording company. So originally, like, computers and records, like, those are pretty different fields of endeavor. It seems like it's okay to have them both called Apple. No big deal, right? Uh, then you kind of fast forward, iTunes, you have uh, Apple providing music online. And so they had a number of different court suits, uh, actually 30 years of on and off court suits. Um, if anyone, if uh, anyone ever wondered why iTunes didn't have the Beatles for like a really, really, really long time, I don't have iTunes, so I, I didn't wonder that very much. But um, uh, and you know, I actually I kind of like the vinyl, but whatever. Anyways, uh, lots of people use iTunes and work like I don't understand why isn't the Beatles on here? And this is the reason why because the uh, trademark collision, where it's like oh. We're providing music, you're providing music. We're called Apple, you're called Apple. We're using a picture of an Apple, you're using a picture of an Apple. So, um, so they had a whole bunch of lawsuits uh, over this. Um, and the, the Beatles ended up with a bunch of money from Apple Computing. And uh, now they're both allowed to use Apple with some constrictions on where they can use them. So I, I imagine Apple Computing still could not produce vinyl records. Although I don't, I don't think that's about to happen. So, uh, the other thing that matters is intent, right? So not only does it do you have to be using it in a separate field of endeavor, you have to be using it in a way that's not intending to impersonate. So we we talked a little bit about that. So if you um, if you had a project and you tried to get it covered by the Apache Software Foundation, and they said no, and then you got mad and decided you would impersonate them. This is their le their registered trademark, and you know. So if you're using this, you're hoping to catch people who are looking for Apache um, and coming to you instead. So this is like you're actually attend you know intending to impersonate the Apache Software Foundation. So that is not okay. Um, so the TLDR is if it feels shady, it's probably illegal. Um, and so uh, now, if you were, if you thought like Apache software was crap, and you decided like you were gonna blog about it, and you, you know, so you were like, oh, I'm gonna talk about how crappy they are, like, because I'm mad they didn't take my project or whatever, uh, any number of other reasons, uh, you can totally do that, and you can, you can do this kind of uh, satire. That is completely okay, and in fact, um, even if it's poorly done. <laughs> Maybe especially if it's poorly done, <laughs> because no one is uh, no one is mistakenly thinking that they've come to the Apache Software Foundation. So, um, the other thing about trademark, so trademark, uh, as, as we have seen, it's anything that sort of lets you know what uh, entity you're dealing with. And so, as the concept of branding has grown over time, the uh, things that are under the purview of trademark has also grown. So uh, T-Mobile in the mobile space said, uh, magenta, that's us. That's our color. Like that's our, you know, if you're gonna sell, if you're gonna sell smartphones, you cannot use that shade of pink. And it was like, what? Like, and they're like, no, 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 that big pink T is part of our trademark. It's part of like what lets people know that they have found, you know, whatever things they associate with our brand. Um, and that's gone uh, not just colors. There's a company that sells thread, uh, and the thread has a certain smell, and they and that they consider that to be part of their brand. Um, I think there's also maybe the the cinnabon folks like that weird kind of cloying butter cinnamon smell is is part of their trademark. I don't think they've had to um, enforce that. No one's trying to get in on that action. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so trademark has expanded over time to be anything that sort of lets you know what entity you're dealing with. So it could be the smell, it could be the color. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, it, but it comes from this original, like, who made these cookies? Like, who sent this flower? And, uh, and then it, it evolved over time. So that hopefully that makes the smell of thread being trademarked make a little bit more sense. Uh, Trademarks can be registered uh, and they must be enforced. So you can't, 
register a trademark and then uh, just kind of sit on it for years and years and years. You have to continually enforce a trademark to keep it as yours. So, um, which is different from some of the other uh, types of uh, intellectual property. Uh, so here's kind of the, again, not a lawyer, don't go sell something or put something on your website based on this information. But in general, um, using the trademark to refer to the holder is fine. Um, using the trademark to talk about the holder is fine. Um, using the trademark to say you're using something, but checking the project's policy. So if you've changed it a lot, like, um, so you could say like powered by Python, but you have to check with the Python Software Foundation to say, to see under which circumstances it's okay for you to say that. Uh, highly questionable, using the trademark to impersonate the holder. Obviously, yes, impersonation, illegal, no matter how you're doing it, virtually or whatever. Um, using your own version of the trademark in a similar context, such that you're creating the possibility of confusion of like, oh, wait, are you guys the records or the computers? I don't know. Um, uh, which, you know, that one's already been fought over. Uh, using the trademark to imply an endorsement that you don't have. So uh, if you were to say, you know, powered by Apache, but you're not really using Apache software and they told you to stop doing that, like, don't do that. Um, and again, check the project's policy if you're not sure, like, oh, do I have an endorsement or not? If that's confusing for you, uh, you can always just ask and they will probably tell you. So, uh, so that's trademark. We're going to move on to copyright. Um, so copyright, uh, was originally intended for physical written books. So this is, this is a huge library. So you can think of it um, as the content, you know, in our fake website analogy there. And uh, it's, it's like the actual uh, what it says. So, um, and copyright is an idea that's been around for a while. Uh, this is um, in 8561. I'm gonna try and read this. Uh, Celtic name for you, King Jarmut Mac Cherbel, or something like that. Uh, he gave the judgment to every cow belongs her calf. So this, the case, like this was when the king would do all the things and people would be angry at each other and they'd bring it before the king. So um, there was uh, one guy, Finian, he owned a copy of a book and this other guy was like, oh, I'm your friend, like, and they would hang out all day, and then at night he would go and like he was secretly making copies of books from his library. And um, eventually, then he he left. He took them back to his own monastery. And then the the first guy came and visited him and is like, "Wait, all these books look really, really familiar. What the heck?" And so they took it before the king, and the king said, "Yeah, well, since he didn't give you permission to do those copies, like he owns them, much like a cow would own its calves." Um, so, uh, you know, so he had to, he had to give back the copies to the other fellow. And so that's really early, like 561. Uh, the, the kind of the general idea that sneaking into other people's libraries and copying their books, like that is kind of the default for a while. Um, and then, uh, you know, maybe in 1518, England decided like two years is enough for you to like kind of get the book out. And then if other people want to make copies, it's like, you have to consider that it would take a really long time for those copies to disseminate out. Like you couldn't just like mail them or email them, of course. Like it's like, oh, it, like even with the two year copyright, it's gonna take like 50 years for it to get across the country. So uh, with people copying it by hand one at a time, unless you really want a specific one, right? Uh, eventually, like copyright expanded and expanded, uh, not only in subject matter, but in uh, the length of time for which it was uh, offered. So, um, you know, we're at a situation now where it is, um, I think it's 70 years after the author. Anyway, it's a, it's a very long time now. Uh, and it covers a lot of other subject matter. So, uh, in, um, in thinking about like books, like the next thing that was added was maps and then other creative works, uh, which is paintings and then photographs, um, movies, cartoons, sheet music, which is a written thing. Uh, and so eventually, because we talk about writing code 
it seemed like that would be the best fit, right, for uh, for a, a intellectual property uh, coverage of software. Uh, and so all of our software licenses rest on top of copyright law because we write it and it invokes copyright. Uh, the way that you get copyright is you just write it. You don't have to register it or anything like that, although it doesn't hurt to um, you know, put a little copyright notice in there so that people understand your intent. But all of our licenses um, rest on the fact that you've written it, you get default copyright, and then you can add additional permissions and responsibilities and requirements on top of default copyright. So everyone's with me so far? Awesome. Uh, so how would you pick a license? Um, the sort of the, the decision tree that I would think of is uh, check your upstream. So if you're submitting a small patch to a much larger project, it's kind of considered obnoxious to uh, pick a completely different license. Be like, I wrote four lines of code. Can I? Uh, and it's like, no, 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 no. So um, if you are writing stuff at work, you probably want to check with your boss before you do that. Although I think that it's less, off, uh, less likely than now that, uh, than it used to be that you wouldn't already know what kind of license your boss wants you to pick. Um, so uh, copyleft and derivative works, I'm a huge copyleft fan. Um, that would be the GPL family of licenses, and that means that you put the code out into the world, and anyone who uh, uses that code and modifies it and then puts their uh, modified pieces back out also allows everyone access. Are people familiar with copyleft? I can go a little deeper on that. There's a now a license, too, where you can do that on the web. So the GPL family of licenses doesn't um, require you to provide source code when people interact with your code on a website, but the AGPL does require you to offer source code when you interact with uh, someone else's code on the website. So uh, I work on a project that's under the AGPL called Media Goblin. So if you want to come and take a look, you can see how that works. Um, and uh, so that's, a, that's, that's the GPL right there. I think the FSF, do you guys have these stickers with you? We do. We have a whole bunch of them at our table. The dynamic duo. The dynamic duo, yeah. So, um, so that's, a good, that's a good time. Uh, there are also um, what is called uh, permissive licenses, or um, there's a, there, there are other words. I'm trying to not use the most loaded terms for things. Um, but uh, permissive licenses are just like, you can have this and do whatever you want with it. But it means that a person may take it and put it into a piece of proprietary software and then not allow you to take a look at the changes. So sometimes that's useful, um, but I would say uh, after you've checked these other things, that is less good. Uh, special snowflakes, this is uh, when you write your own license. Uh, please don't <laughs> do not do that. That's, that's almost more obnoxious than putting a four-line patch under a totally different license. It's like, oh, I wrote my own. It means you have to do the chicken dance or buy me a beer, like, which basically means no one will use it. If that's your goal, you could just not put it under a, a, a fake free software license. So um, special snowflakes are not recommended. Uh, unless you're an expert, maybe. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I don't know if anyone here is a copyright law expert, aside from Bradley, maybe Donald. Yeah. So for the rest of us, just take the licenses that are there. Um, and uh, as I said, the term of copyright now is life plus seven years. Life of the author plus seven, 70 years. Or you can advocate for more if you're like, say, Disney. Um, right? So that one's, I, I'm not going to, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that's fairly famous. Um, and um, additionally, this is sort of the default in lots and lots of countries. So there's a, the Berne Convention, 168 countries have signed on and more all the time. And, the U.S. is one of those countries that requires you to harmonize with our IP law um, when uh, we negotiate for trade with you. So um, like other countries kind of feel like physical trade and um, creative works should be negotiated separately, but the uh, U.S. doesn't do that. So anytime you hear harmonize, you should be worried is basically what I'm saying. So. Uh, so for a long time, like I said, software was covered mainly by copyright. And then eventually, uh, it became sometimes also sort of covered by patents. 
So we're going to look at how that happens. <laughs> so to start with, uh, patents are for the functionality. Uh, you can think of it in, in short, uh, you know, as the answer to, but what does it do, right? That's kind of that's that's the original intent is that um, patents were supposed to be for something that did something or f performed a function. So, like early patents would be on things like physical stuff, like it's a pin, but it's got this nice ball in the end so that you don't poke a hole in your thumb every time you use it. Like, hooray! And it's pretty obvious, like. If I had, you know, the patent on pins with little balls on the end, and then you were making pins with little balls in the end, we would be able to hold those two pins next to each other and be like, you've used my little ball on the end idea. I can see it. It's very, very obvious, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure that one's um, expired. You can go ahead and make pins with balls on the end. But, um, you know, so, so that was, like, so originally patents were pretty easy to, enforce and understand the scope of and all those kinds of things. Um, eventually they became a little more vague. Uh, at some point we thought like medicine and, and chemicals and, and medical procedures could also be, you know, because they have a, a physical manifestation in the form of a pill and they perform a function in a person. Um, so you kind of see this like, like, oh, that's a little, like, what pill is that? I don't know. Like, what's in there? What does it do? Well, from looking at it, it's hard to tell. So you see it becomes more and more difficult to define, like, the scope and to see, uh, you know, with your eyes whether or not someone has uh, infringed on your patent, right? So it becomes a little fuzzier. Um, fast forward a little bit more, eventually we've got uh, patents on business methods, which are basically patents on ideas. And that, uh, that is kind of down the, the rabbit hole altogether, which this, I mean, this whole kind of, the patents and ideas sort of opens this huge floodgate of problems. Um, right now we have a, a rise in what we call functional claiming. So um, we saw how physical patents are on a thing, like a thing that does something, right? And then uh, we have software patents, which are, I noticed a problem, and I'm going to fix it using software on a computer. And the USPTO is like, hmm, well, if you throw enough of garbage verbiage on top of that, like, yeah, we'll totally grant that patent. I'm paraphrasing. That's not from their website. <laughs> um, but that is, that is how it works. Um, so functional claiming means that, oh, well, you know, I have a problem and a solution, and the solution is software. When you, you used to say, like, oh, I have a problem, like, I get that little hole in my thumb, and the solution is that plastic ball, and you can see it, and I drew a picture of it, and, you know, all these types of things. With software, it's like, oh, so the, the problem, and then the solution is, you know, software <laughs> stuff. I'm not going to include the source code, because we're, you know, that's, like, a copyrighted. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Yeah, so functional claiming gives rise to these very broad and vague patents that are very hard to define the scope of. It's hard to figure out when you've infringed it. Uh, you probably have. That's just how it goes. Um, but it's, uh, so it creates this huge legal uncertainty. And then people go to the court and say, can you sort out this legal uncertainty? which we talked about how expensive lawyers are at the beginning, but for a patent suit, yikes. So, um, yeah, asking the question of like, are you infringing a patent, it's, it's kind of more, it's like a weather report. So like, you go into video codecs and it's like, yeah, it's a 90% chance of infringement today, you know? And then if you were gonna say, look at compression algorithms, it's like, are you using something old that you learned in computer science? You're probably okay, but if you're using something new, you've got like a 75% chance of infringement. Um, and then, you know, for mobile devices, you might as well just be keep, you know, keep on checking the weather in Antarctica. Is it gonna be cold today? <laughs> oh yeah, it's gonna be cold today. Yep, it totally is. You're for the mobile space, you're nearly always infringing. So um, so a lot of times when I tell people that, they're like, oh, but like maybe we should pass a law to make some stuff not patentable. Uh, and, and the first thing they're like, well, we should make it so math isn't patentable. And it's like, well, that's actually already the case. So I'll go through what is not supposed to be patentable. 
So things people have already done. Um, so uh, this is where we say patents must be on something that is novel, which just means new. And um, so things that people have already done are not supposed to be patentable. The trouble with the USPTO is that they don't have the best database to actually know what the current prior, you know, art is. And so they don't really know what's novel. Like, um, you know, they're not going to like our, our repositories and trying to sort through each line of code and figure out what it's doing. Um, so that's, that's not happening. Um, things that are obvious. So um, if you, uh, has anyone made a basket? I've asked this before here, I think. Like, okay. So when you hear, uh, if you make baskets, uh, the term underwater basket weaving doesn't sound weird to you. But for someone who has not made a basket, it's like, what? That sounds like some weird new yoga. Like, what the heck? Um, the basket's underwater. It makes the strands pliable. So for a basket maker, underwater basket weaving is completely obvious. So the USPTO should not grant any patents on underwater basket weaving. I don't know about the patents in the basket space, so I, uh, that's just an example. Um, but things that are obvious to a person who is skilled in that area are not supposed to be granted. So that's already on the books. Um, things that don't or can't exist. So um, there's oh, it's like a one where someone's like, oh, I'm going to read minds with magnets. Like, and the USPTO is like, no, that's, I'm sorry, no. Or, or like time travel, and they're like, also, no. <laughs> um, so algorithms on their own. This is where we get into that sort of like, you know, fuzzy language where uh, they're like, oh, well, it's an algorithm that's being used with a physical device, or which could just be a computer. So uh, on their own, they're not supposed to be patentable. So the, the rules for the USPTO is you don't say, like, I would like to patent some math. And they're supposed to say no. Um, and then you're like, oh, but I'm going to put it on a device, and we're going to use it in a really specific space. And then it's like, oh, all right, then. Yeah. But that's not how it's supposed to be. So um, naturally occurring phenomena. So, uh, you know, grass, the way people breathe, stuff like that, also not supposed to be patentable. Um, illegal activity seems, there, like, uh, there was older um, statutes about things, like, uh, had to be, like, morally good. So there was a lot of, you know, like, uh, like databases that serve porn wouldn't have been patentable many years ago, but now they would be. Um, because it's not illegal. So that, that one actually has relaxed a little. It used to just be anything they considered immoral. Um, and then uh, tax fraud. This is a, they kind of spelled this out in the America Invents Act a couple of years ago. They're like, oh, yeah, like uh, methods of like doing something hinky with your taxes so that you pay less. Like you can't patent those. The U.S. government is not going to give you a patent on bilking <laughs> the U.S. government out of money. Right, 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 yeah, no, it's like, <laughs> exactly, you can, uh, you just can't have a patent on it, <laughs> so. Um, so that leaves a lot of stuff that's still patentable, right? <laughs> uh, and that leaves a lot of patents, which means a lot of patent suits. These are the ones involving NPEs, which are trolls, uh, but I, I don't want to paint the picture that trolls are the only entities bringing software patent suits, and I'm going to talk tons more about what's going on in this space uh, at my talk tomorrow. But, um, and it, they're not even always suing people who are uh, making stuff. 40% of the time they're just suing people who are using stuff. So, because um, if you're using something that's patented, then you can, you are eligible to receive a letter. Um, and like I said, it's not, it is not just about trolls, uh, because, um, if you're being sued by a practicing entity or a troll, it doesn't matter because that is still you and that still sucks. So, um, so what can you do? Uh, I said uh, before, I work at the Open Invention Network. We do a non-aggression community for FOSS, which is you join it and uh, along with all of our other members, you agree not to sue each other. And it's a growing, I think we're at like 1,100 companies and projects in there. Uh, it also includes access to our defensive patent pool, which is a number of patents you can use if you are sued to uh, counter sue with. Uh, choose a license with a patent clause. I would say GPLv3 is a really awesome license that you could use that says 
if you use my software, you can't sue me for patent infringement on the stuff that I offered to you. Um, the Apache license also has something, so if you're going to go permissive, then, uh, then you should, you know, still pick a license with a patent clause. Uh, defensive publishing, which is uh, helping the USPTO understand what the current state of the art is by uh, taking inventions and putting them in their database so that they know that the stuff that is obvious to you uh, has already been invented and that they should not give other entities patents on those things. So, um, so recap. <laughs> I went kind of quickly, but I wanted to leave time for questions. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but for trademark, basically, don't pretend to be someone else. So everyone is clear on, <laughs> on that, right? Um, copyright, choose a license that matches your goals for your code. And, um, and I would say, f like, further to that, if your goal is to see free software grow, then you should choose a copyleft license. The, the permissive is not going to, um, that's not going to be enough, unless your goal is to just have Apple take your stuff and sell it without giving you money, which people have that goal. and it's, that's just how it is. Um, and then uh, for patents, the best offense is defense. Um, unless you have unlimited cash, like Rackspace or Newegg, and you want to spend money to defeat patent trolls in court, um, the best offense is the defensive measures that I talked about, like getting onto a non-aggression pool and uh, getting an, a number of patents that you can use for defensive purposes. And um, again, if you are in doubt, you should get a lawyer. Um, this is an insane clown posse pretending to be lawyers. I wouldn't get these guys, but <laughs> uh, yeah. And then, of course, I have picture credits because we were talking about all of these things. Um, and uh, I would be happy to take your questions. Yeah. So uh, Elon Musk has opened up this uh, for anybody who uses mm. it. It's, it's a different area than software, but have you guys looked at his patents to see if how many of them, if it helps the open source movement? Right, so the, um, I, I'm, we're recording this year, um, uh, which means don't tell me about your friend's company that's involved in a lawsuit. Um, but uh, the question is, Elon Musk, uh, it's a different area, and have we looked into how that might help the uh, FOSS movement? Um, one, uh, actually cars and software, we used to always use this great example of like, oh, free software is like the car, you can still open the trunk, you know, open the, you know, the hood and tinker on it, um, whereas, like, proprietary software is, like, if they welded the hood shut. And actually, like, cars and software are a big mess, like, you got your chocolate and my peanut butter kind of thing now. Um, so the, uh, so the <coughs> Elon Musk space future car thing has, it actually has software in it, as do most modern cars. They have some amount of software in them. That's possible. I uh, we drive like a twenty-two-year-old Honda, so I don't know. But um, it's uh, so uh, I, I don't know about the quality of the software. But uh, so one, cars and software are actually no longer separate entities. Um, two, uh, what Elon Musk did is a patent pledge, uh, which it's not really the same as a contract. Like he said, like, hey guys, coming in the water's fine. I'm not going to sue you as long as, like, you know, to be determined later, don't be a jerk. Which, like, it's kind of subjective as to, like, when he has decided you've become a jerk. I mean, I'm not saying he's, like, setting it up as, like, a, like a honeypot to, you know, trick you into using his patents. But what you have legally there is not a contract. Um, so while the, it's the right direction, it's better than saying, like, come at me, bro, I'll sue your butt. Um, it's, 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 not as, uh, it's not as substantive as, as we would like. So I'm, you know, I don't know if you're going to build a space supercar, but um, you might want to ask for something on paper, like signed specifically to you before you jump in and use his patents. Does that answer your? Yeah. OK. You have a question over here? Yes. Oh, okay. So uh, the question or comment is that um, your friends that sell statistical analysis to Oracle 
Um, and yeah, so um, so data is not supposed to be patentable in and of itself, but sometimes the arrangement of it or like the uh, the summary would could which is writing and uh, talking about the inferences could be copyrighted. So uh, there are a lot of different companies that do this where they get their own gloss on the data and then try to cover it with like, like oh, you can't take our exact gloss of it or they produce it as a chart and then the chart is an image that's copyrighted or something like that. So, it's, uh, so the data, the underlying raw data isn't, um, copyrightable or patentable, but um, it's maybe more in the trade secret area where they like, and then they produce, like their shaping of it is what they have decided they to get protection it. on it. How they apply it, basically, what you're saying. Uh, apply it or describe it or, um, yeah, I mean it depends, like, so this is pretty theoretical because you're, what we, it's like some statistical analysis, so I don't know exactly but my guess would be that it's something about the look of it and then their uh, writing that uh, describes what is, you know, like their take on it. So, yeah. Uh, right here and then I'll go in the back. Regarding trademarks, who determines how similar the contexts are? Like, for example, mm -hmm. if I'm creating a mobile game called Square, could Square, the payment company, sue me because they're both mobile apps? Or is this, like, who determines how All right, so who determines how close the uh, field of endeavor is for trademark? Um, and could, if you did something else called Square, like could the people that do Square sue you? Um, anyone can send you a letter uh, from their lawyer at any time. What you decide to do about it is a totally different thing. Um, so uh, it's actually, it's up to the courts to decide if you get a letter. Um, so the, the tricky thing is with this area is like, oh, what, what people always want to know is like, what are the three things that I can do to ensure that I never get sued? And there is no such thing. Like, because the people that do the suing are just people. It's kind of like being like, how can I keep my cat off the counter? And it's like, well, you can yell at them. You can make the counter look unappealing. I don't know. But like, eventually, like, one of them will get up there. So it's, it's um, or maybe not, you know, if you're, if you're not a tempting target or what have you. Um, but uh, it's, so it's up to the courts, which is where a lot of the like kind of um, chilling effect in some of the areas that we talked about, especially patents where it's like, oh, you know, like someone's making a lot of noise, like, oh, you know, we've, we've got patents on that stuff you're using, that stuff you love so much, like that, that Linux kernel. Sure would be a shame if someone came and uh, took that business away from you. So, um, you know, a company could do that and never actually bring a suit. Um, uh, we know Microsoft's done that. Um, thanks for paying for the party tonight, though. Um, it's a, but there's supposed to be a newer, uh, friendlier Microsoft now. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's one of those things. So the threat of a lawsuit, because they are so expensive, you know, it um, can uh, create this entire chilling effect on what ends up in, uh, in free software programs. So uh, for a long time, and I don't know if anyone even brought any suits on the um, anti-aliasing on the fonts, but for a long time, if you were going to show your friend, like, oh, hey, I'm using this, like, totally different software. It's free. It's made by the community. It's awesome. And then you show it to your friend, and they're like, oh, the fonts are all kind of crafty. And you're like... Yeah, but we couldn't fix them because the the anti aliasing it was like there was enough like kind of barking around uh, like, oh well you know we've got the patents on that anti aliasing stuff so like you better keep those fonts crufty, so um, yeah so the I guess I I I don't know if the square people would sue you because I don't know how litigiously minded they are. Um, and I don't know the answer to the more underlying question, which is how do you make sure you never get sued? So, I it have fell in the back and then we'll come back up here. I kind of back to the gentleman in the front about his uh, friend who has some old school software ideas mm -hmm. on, on Oracle. What if the uh, background database was something in the open source community? Could, um. could his friend still, I mean, I know that there's plenty of Sure. Databases on the backside of their their product that they sell. Mm -hmm. um, what, where's the where's the line for uh, what becomes yours and sellable and, and what is open to the community to deal with free will? 
Um, I'm going to not use the steel. Um, so uh, the question is, if you're using uh, a FOSS database and you're doing statistical analysis, like where's the line between what's yours and what is uh, up for grabs or uh, on offer? Um, the data and the program are always separate. So uh, th this is, a, uh, I was hoping, less common misconception, but uh, is uh, by putting your data in a free software database, uh, program, it does not make your data magically subject to the GPL. They're always totally separate. So um, your content, so the database, the you know that stuff would be more like your, um, you know your it, that's your stuff. It's not. It doesn't have anything to do with the program. I mean, so if you were writing maybe like uh, scripts or bindings. Right. So, oh, so you're saying like if you got like municipal data and then yeah. millions of lines of data that are from say the uh, yeah some the municipal entity. Right. So you would. If you wanted to do that, uh, you would probably need to sell a copyrighted report that includes your take on the data. Again, like that's a little that's a little farther away. Like I'm more of a, a software person and not uh, a data person, but um, I think you wouldn't be able to, if you're using um, a copylefted database and putting your stuff back out into the world. Um, then uh, your improvements to the database would be available. But if you're only making it available on your website, then it doesn't trigger the um, GPL requirements. I, I, I don't want to go too deep down because this is very theoretical, and so I, I know that can get um, really tricky. I will say that if you are using a GPL database, that you could look at GPL FAQ, uh, which is um, hosted by the GNU Project, and that has a lot of those, like, um, you know, a whole collection of those edge cases of like, when have I triggered this? When has this happened? What do you mean by derivative? And um, so that if you had like a specific actual use case rather than a theoretical one, I would go there and, and check it against the GPL FAQ. Um, I, I think you had your hand up first and then we'll go over here. So. Um, do you have, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the international oh. sort of scene and, um, and maybe Mm -hmm. in different sorts of regimes for you guys here in the U.S., mm -hmm. people in Europe versus other countries. Right. So could I talk a little bit more about the international regime? Honestly, I am going to talk about that a little bit more in depth tomorrow, but the, um, uh, I guess the shorter answer is that if you are providing, if you're selling software or uh, building software that gets used in the U.S., then uh, you can be sued in the U.S. for uh, either infringement of patents or copyrights, um, although the copyright is very, un, uh, that doesn't happen very much. Uh, but the, if you're building software uh, in another country and you're selling it to people in the U.S., uh, you could be sued by a U.S. company for infringement. Does that answer a little bit? I, I promise I w could go deep on like who has patents and what they're doing with them and uh, tomorrow. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, and then I think Adam and then you. Okay. So say I write an, an Android app. Uh, how do I invoke the help of the Open Invention Network? Do I just use the AGPL or something, or do I? Oh. A partner or uh, those are totally different things. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> I'm glad you asked, though. So how do you invoke the help of the Open Invention Network? Do you just put your software under the AGPL? So the Open Invention Network uh, is uh, for patent protection, and the AGPL is a license which rests on copyright law. Um, and so uh, if you want to join the defensive patent pool for the Open Invention Network, just shoot me a note for your uh, project or uh, company or what have you. Um, if you want. Uh, if you want some advice on how to apply and use the AGPL, you could uh, talk with the FSF Licensing Queue, or you could uh, talk with Media Goblin about how we've decided uh, best to meet the requirements of the AGPL. So totally separate things. Um, so, But I would encourage you to do both, join the Open Invention Network and put your code under the AGPL. So. Because you mentioned the AGPL had something about patents. 
Oh, sorry, the GPL has a patent clause. Uh, I actually don't, I can't remember now if the AGPL also has a patent clause. The GPL is exactly the same. Right, except for the web. Yeah, right, so either one. So then you'll do, you'll do what? I mean, I'll say, hey, I've wrote an Android app. Mm -hmm. help, help Deb, or what, what would you do? Yeah, uh, so you've written an Android app. Uh, like, how do you apply a license? Yeah, okay, I, I wrote an app that's a new way to catch a bus. Okay. And then I say, I'm, I'm worried that I might get sued by the other bus company. Right, okay, so there's a couple things you could do. One, you join the Open Invention Network. Two, uh, take the invention that you've done and uh, turn it into uh, a defensive publication, which is saying, I invented this, don't give anyone else a patent on it, and then we register it with the US Patent and Trade Office. So you, you'll register it. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then also put it under a software license that says, hey, anyone who is, you're welcome to use this code for whatever you want, but then don't go patent in and then sue me for patent infringement. Do you, you want to like? Well, I'm just wondering how Oh. Company is not a member of OIN. How, how would he be helped about that from their aggression by OIN? Right. So uh, you might and you might not. Again, it's it's not it's not a hundred percent. We're not saying like you'll never get sued if you join OIN. I'm well, absolutely not saying that. Not right. So if the other bus app company is in there, then awesome, and you could you could even t nudge us and suggest that we talk to them, or um, you would have other you would have access to other patents on cross license that may be similar. No Depending on it again, it depends on the specific area, the way that you're using your app, and the way that you've built it. Okay, and sorry, just total end follow up, just so we get end to end. Is yeah. there a cost to joining the OIN? No. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, did you wanna? I just wanted to clarify on that. So, would it, the bus company could leave OIN and 90 days later sue him under your agreement, right? Well, not on the um, not on the patents that they had while they were in the pool. So that if they left the if they left the pool and then made new patents, then they could sue you on those new patents. So uh, any company can enter or leave at any time, but it doesn't. Do some change to the agreement? Because the agreement four years ago worked the way I read it. I haven't read it for four years, I think. Oh, OK. No, I don't think so. I think that that is, that is it's not supposed to be um, There's also license to it. If the, if the bus company <coughs> basically implicitly said, I don't can use my patents by being part of OIN, and then they leave, and they say, no, you can't use my patents, then Adam's kind of got to Defense, but if the OAN agreement says that they can sue later, they can sue later. Right. And I'll, uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll double check that, but that's not my understanding of the current uh, version of the license. And then I know you've been waiting for a while. Oh, yeah. So when I mentioned permissive licenses briefly, um, the MIT license is a version of the permissive license. And the legal impact of that is basically like, you can use this, but don't um, sue us if it doesn't work or it breaks your stuff. So yeah. And the BSD is another common version of uh, what we call a permissive license. So that's the Berkeley, that came out of UC Berkeley originally. And so um, they, there's a couple different versions of that one, different clauses, and, and uh, they have slightly different requirements, but the uh, but they none of them invoke any type of a copy left. So does that answer that question? Yeah, in the middle. Uh, how involved is Creative Commons in the software? Uh, so how involved is Creative Commons in the software area? So uh, Creative Commons licenses also rest on default copyright. And uh, in fact, the Creative Commons movement took their uh, inspiration from the GPL and the copy left that is there. Um, so the GPL was around with the, like, I'll share it to you as long as you um, uh, will share it back if you, make, if you make changes and share them out to the world. Uh, so the CC by SA license is uh, analogous, but for content, not for software code, to the GPL. In, in broad strokes, those are like, a, 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 when you get down to details like software code and uh, creative works really should have different types of licenses. Um, and uh, so the, uh, there are a lot of uh, Creative Commons licenses on some of the artwork that you might find in your software. So it's worth knowing what's in there. Um, your documentation might be under the GNU free documentation license or the uh, 
programmer may have chosen to put their documentation under some kind of a Creative Commons license, but because it's writing, it first invokes default copyright and then something must be added as additional responsibilities and permissions on top. So that, okay, cool. Um, anything else? Oh yeah. If you're creating a software and you don't want to make it available through open source methods, um, is it best to to patent that, or does it raise your target profile to where the trolls are going to find out you're patenting or something to sue you? Oh, okay. So if you're asking me to give you advice on writing proprietary software, <laughs> I uh, I don't I, I don't think I can answer that. <laughs> no, um, uh. So I, I, the only thing I will say, <laughs> right, 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 that's being recorded. Um, I will say something that I've, that I've noticed is that um, when you go for VC funding, they almost always say that they would like for you to have patented your thing because they, they want, you know, it's part of the, it's one of the pressures on our community to produce proprietary software instead of free software. Um, and I'll tell you right now that it's, it's not this like, oh man, we really want you to succeed. It's like, it's more like, uh, we know that 90% of the, these starry-eyed ideas completely fail and we'd like to be able to sell your patent when you go belly up. So uh, consider that like friendly advice when they're like, oh, you should really get a patent. They're like, and then we'll give you money and we'll sell it when your company fails in New York, which we're 90% certain is going to happen. So I guess consider if you really want to be a partner with someone that thinks you only have a 10% chance of succeeding. Um, but uh, yeah, I, um, I don't really have much other advice for writing proprietary software or, or, or anything in that area. Uh, but lawyers are pretty good at that stuff, so you know. I, again, I'm not a lawyer, so. <laughs> other questions, comments? Okay, um, I have a... Um, PSA, if you're uh, in the area and you uh, would like to, Siegel, our dates are set. We would love to see you there also. That's a complete separate, just a you know, PSA. So thanks so much. Hi,